Galen Strawson is Professor of Philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin. Amongst countless papers in metaphysics and philosophy of mind, Galen is the author of Freedom and Belief, The Subject of Experience, Consciousness and Its Place in Nature, and most recently, Things That Bother Me, Death, Freedom, The Self, etc. The widespread impact of these works cannot be understated. In the words of Stephen Fry, Galen Strawson has a marvellous gift for untangling even the most complex lines in philosophical thinking and laying them straight. He writes with humour, clarity, and always from a recognisably human place. Even the most complex and controversial areas in modern philosophy come into the light when you're in his benign company. He opens windows and finds light switches like no other philosopher writing today. In part one, we'll be talking to Galen Strawson about the things that bother him, namely death, freedom, the self and consciousness. And in part two, we'll be engaging in some further analyses and discussion, as well as asking some of your listener questions. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank all of our listeners. Sincerely and wholeheartedly, thank you. Without your support, we wouldn't be where we are today. A very special thank you to our patrons. If you'd like to support the show and get early access to the next part of this episode, a link to our Patreon page can be found in the iTunes description. We highly recommend picking up a copy of Galen Strawson's latest book, Things That Bother Me, Death, Freedom, The Self, etc. You can find a link to the book in our iTunes description, as well as on our website, thepansycast.com. We're also giving away three signed copies of Things That Bother Me, so do head over to our Twitter page or our Facebook page to be in with a chance of winning. Thank you. We hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to episode 43 of the Pan Psycast. I'm Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by the man irresponsible for the way that he is, Mr. Ollie Marley. Hello. And Professor of Philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin, Galen Strawson. Hello. Before we begin, I'd just like to say a quick thank you to Gregory Miller for his assistance in researching this episode. He's stuck in Budapest still and couldn't be with us today as planned. Galen, Greg said he'd like to send his apologies, but adds that he's ultimately irresponsible for the way that he is. <laughs> Granted. <clears throat> so, Galen, we're going to start off with our first question. We ask all of our guests, uh, what is philosophy? Well, I'm just going to give you the answer I prefer, which is the answer that was made by Wilfred Sellers. You probably know it. Okay. The aim of philosophy is to understand how things, in the broadest possible sense of the term, hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. And then he goes on a bit and says that by things he means just about everything. I mean, really everything. Cabbage, not only cabbages and kings, but numbers and duties and possibilities and so on. This is very different to what um, Daniel Dennett told us. He told us that um, philosophy is just about sorting out the questions and passing them on to science. Would you disagree with his view here? Do you think that philosophy is just about getting the questions straight? No, I wouldn't agree. <laughs> Uh, what In that case, then, uh, what progress can philosophy make? Well, it can, it can get things right that are not a matter for science. Look, I think that science is tremendously important to philosophy. All the great philosophers have been completely wrapped up in the latest science, mm. but it doesn't just reduce to passing on questions to science. Could you give us an example of a, a, a thing that philosophy can answer that, that science can't then, where philosophy makes progress without science? Well, I, I hesitate to bring up the topic of free will straight away, but this is a topic that I think you you can give the answer to. It's completely a priori. And, of course, what a priori means is, as we like to say, you can do it without getting out of your armchair. You do not have to go and look at the world to see how the world is in order to answer the question. So I think we can show that there's a... Perhaps we're going to talk about this later, but we can show that there's a very natural, very strong sense of free will given which it's not possible, and you've, it's actually an armchair matter. So, Galen, you've made uh, fantastic and invaluable contributions in the field of philosophy of mind uh, and beyond its borders. Um, how is it that you personally got into philosophy in the first place? Well, I don't know if there... I, I'm, I'm a great believer in the idea that nearly everything worthwhile has already been said before in mm. philosophy, and I don't know how you think that reacts with the idea of progress, but so I don't know whether... They're fantastic and invaluable. But what was your question? It was... How did you get into it? How did I get into it? Uh, 
Well, actually, there is. A, I do have a narrative, as they say, although I don't approve. <laughs> um, well, very briefly, I studied. In fact, I studied Oriental studies for my first two years at university, and then I got. I thought I wanted to do something that would be a little more exercise my intellectual faculties, if any, a little more. So I switched to social and political science. And when I did that, I really did feel after a year that it was like a building that as it were, started on the fourth floor. And I thought that the foundations or the, the original floors would be in philosophy, so I thought I'd go and do philosophy for a year and then go back, and I never went back. That's how. That is a true causal story, I believe. Does this go any further back? I mean, do you remember having any philosophical thoughts growing up, or was it more kind of when you were doing your, uh, you know, your degree that you kind of came across these philosophical thoughts? Um, well, I didn't talk about it with my father, if that's one thing you might have in mind. There was nothing, none of that. But I did have philosophical thoughts, things that would qualify as philosophical. But, but I don't know whether I had more than other other children. For, for example, I wondered whether other people see colors the same way as I do. Mm. And now when I asked that question to my classes, say, how many of you as children wondered that? I get almost half the class, so nothing special about that. And I also got very worried about death. I mm. um, had a, had a non-religious upbringing. And uh, yeah, I was, that really tormented me. But whether that's a philosophical question, I'm not sure. I think it falls in the area of big questions, but mm. yeah, so I did. But I th think that most children do or did before they had screens in front of them all the time. <laughs> So you, you mentioned, yeah, you, you thought about death and, and, um, I guess the, uh, the person's perception of color. But it, what, what was the first distinctly philosophical text you remember reading? And if not that, then which one did you really get your teeth into and thought, right, I'm going to go on and study this and, and eventually become a professor in the subject? Oh, uh, whether, I'm not sure whether I ever thought very far ahead. Um, and most of the time I was <clears throat> growing my hair and, taking <clears throat> recreational drugs. <laughs> uh, uh, but, I mean, briefly, I decided to change from social and political science in my third year and do philosophy in my fourth. I came back from Syria that summer. I caught hepatitis. I was in bed for six weeks, and uh, I picked up Language, Truth, and Logic by Freddie Eyre, and I mm. must have, must surely not the first to have started off with that. Found it incredibly hard to read. A pa you know, a page would take half an hour. So that I think, as far as I know, that is the first distinctively philosophical text. But I should add that, you know, I was interested in mystical things, so mm. I was reading works of that kind too before. Um, we have a lot of aspiring philosophers listening to the show. Could you offer them any advice in studying philosophy? One of the things that worries me is that it seems to me, when it comes to the question of consciousness, a good example is that most people seem to imprint on their first teachers, a bit like little goslings imprint on Mother Goose. Mm. You probably know that stuff. And it's an extraordinarily powerful effect, and I actually don't know how to, to um, combat it. But I, would, I suppose my one piece of advice would be try just to think about the thing itself. Um, independently of the doing the reading you do is there a particular philosopher you mentioned not to be imprinted by your by your teachers um we mentioned just off microphone that philip goff on our previous guest was a student of yours and um he is a panpsychist like you and i was a student of goff's and i'm a pan the show is called the panpsychist so i can't really claim that he hasn't influenced me in any way is there a is there a person um or a, a dissertation supervisor or something that influenced you significantly i'm not sure that there is actually uh so the free you know my thesis my phd thesis was on free will and that was there i was reading around and not knowing what to do hmm. and suddenly came i came of course first came across it in a sort of side street as it were it was a section in jonathan bennett's book about kant's dialectic and i just was gripped and i have always held the view I formed at that point. And so I wasn't led into that topic in any sense at all by someone else. And I don't think that I've been influenced by anyone else. <laughs> Sounds, I, did, it's not, I, I don't know whether that might sound arrogant, but that took up the first 10 years of my time, mm. for example. And I suppose I learnt the trade during that time. And I don't think that any of my various supervisors at Oxford influenced me much. 
Before we get into part one and look at your views on the self and consciousness and death as well, um, how would you sum up your main philosophical positions? Um, would you say you're an atheist? Would you say you're a, a panpsychist? What kind of labels would you uh, put on your philosophical views? I would say that I'm a, a naturalist, a real naturalist, as I like to say, as opposed to fake naturalists. And I think most people who call themselves naturalists are fake naturalists. I am an atheist with respect to any the Christian God and perhaps probably any Abrahamic God. Mm. Not a yes. Would you consider yourself a humanist? Uh, I thought I, I think I'm a humanist, but the first when I the first time I I thought that was a term of that named something good. But mm. I was in Australia in 1993 and turned out to be a term of abuse. I didn't know this. Um, it seemed that a humanist meant somebody who thought that there were universal human traits right. and so rejected the idea that it was all culturally conditioned. Uh, I would reject that view too, mm. so I think I am a, a humanist both in what I see as the the, 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 na the good sense and probably in what some people see as the bad <laughs> sense. Good. Um, finally, a uh, last question before we move on is, it's very rare that a philosopher maintains the same views throughout their lives. We had Eugen Nagasawa from the University of Birmingham who told us that the ontological argument converted him from atheism to theism. And we had uh, Peter Singeron tell us how he moved from preference utilitarianism to hedonistic utilitarianism. The first shift is certainly more powerful than the latter there. But uh, is there a philosophical view that you once held that you've later went on to reject? To be, this isn't really so much a view as a bit of terminology. Mm. I used to think that if you were going to call yourself a materialist, you had to think that there was something non-conscious non or non-experiential in reality. I now think that that's not the case, um, which means in, in practice that I use the word in a way that very few people accept. But the idea behind that, I, again, I don't know if we're going to talk about it later, it's just that physics is as I like to say, silent on the question of the ultimate intrinsic nature of matter. And so it doesn't rule out the possibility that it's entirely experiential or mental in some way. So I've moved on that. I've moved in that way. Uh, I can't actually think of anything else that I've changed, large and important that I've changed my mind on. Part 1. The Self, Death, Freedom and Consciousness So in the words of Oliver Sacks, each of us constructs and lives a narrative. This narrative is us, our identities. So Gavin, what do you think Sacks is getting at here? It's interesting, in the bit you just read, uh, the word is is in italics. He says this narrative is us. It's what we are. What do I think he's getting at here? Well, I think I have to say something about the word identity, something I didn't discover until relatively recently. I think that philosophers and psychologists use the word very differently. So when philosophers use it, I think they mean, as it were, your true essence, if you allow, allow that word just for the sake of argument. Turns out that psychologists don't mean that. They, they literally mean what, how you think of yourself. Right. So now I now I now see after having quoted this before this and said that I thought it was completely wrong I now see why people like Sachs say this kind of thing part of what they mean is just this is how we think of ourselves um in response to that I don't I still don't think it's right because I th I don't think that w narrative implies some as it were view of your life as a development over time in fact over the whole of your life mm. and I don't see that as a necessary part of people's picture of themselves. I think they may have views about their character, how they are in general, but I don't think, I'm sure it's not for everyone grounded in a story, as we say, of their own past. Certainly not for me. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> well, this, 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 so we're getting into the word of identity. So do we, do we think that most people then, do they see it as themselves or their perception of themselves, this narrative? Is, I mean, when, if you walk up to the average person on the street, are they going to say, you know, if we say, what is your identity? Do we think they're going to refer to the perception of themselves or kind of themselves? Uh, well, I mean, they're going to think 
that they've got it right. So they're going to think that what they think of their identity <laughs> is their real identity. Uh, so that's the answer to that sub, sub question, as it were. So the narrative self, um, do you call it the dia, diacro? No, okay. Here I have to. Yes, there's a couple, to, there's, there's a, something important here. There's, yes. There are two distinctions side by side which are different, although they're connected. Okay. One of them at least is really simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll use my old words for this, although I've changed my words now. So that's okay. the distinction between the diachronic and the episodic. Good. And here's what a diachronic person is. It's someone who, when they think back, or indeed think forward, say, let's think back five years into the past or something, think of themselves, and they think, that's me. That's yeah. their intuitive mm-hmm. experience. That's me. It's very difficult doing this with young students because they don't have enough history. You know? yeah, yeah. Uh, they're all finishing up in their fifth birthday party. <laughs> uh, and an episodic is someone who doesn't. Who and and there's a huge range. You know, if I think back a year and I try to think of myself, then do I think that that's me? I have no intuitive sense that it's mm. me. So that's episodic versus diachronic. Narrative versus non-narrative is people who, in the in the way that I still don't really understand. Uh, somehow conceive of their lives as or think or live their lives through a sense of it as a narrative versus people who don't. And I would even distinguish between the non-narrative and the and the anti-narrative, people for whom that way of thinking is completely alien. And that includes me. So this on this first view, I think of my life as a story, as if I just think of any novel, okay? And I see myself as having a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I identify with myself across time. I identify with Jack as five, and I'll identify as Jack when he's 50. But you want to say that you don't identify with yourself in uh, when you're five. That's the episodic bit. Is this what you think? You're an epi- you see yourself as the episodic self. Yeah, but already um, that's different from being narrative. So I, of course, have a perfectly good kind of chronology of my own life. I yes. know when I did my O-levels and my A-levels and so on, when I got married and so on. Got all that, but uh, I don't... Th- do I think of myself through that history? No. Uh, yeah. That history had enormous causal effects on how I am, no doubt, mm. but it just doesn't feature in my thinking about myself. I think for most people, just a, a bit of naive reflection after reading the book, I, I think most people do see themselves as having that narrative. Or, or maybe it's that they have this, they've got these, this medley of different life events. And if they're asked, like we asked you some introductory questions about your life, and you, then you're forced to put them into a narrative. Do you, do you have any more thoughts on, I guess, most people or people as a whole? I know it's difficult to sum up people as a whole. You haven't met most people. But do, do most people think of themselves as a narrative self? Well, or is it, or are you, is it just you and a, and a small number of other people? I still think there's a lot of difficulty in the phrase narrative self. So I have, a, I've, I'm, I've, I've just written a paper called, well, it was originally called Narrow Babble, but I changed okay. it to a very dignified title. It's now <laughs> called On the Use of the Notion of Narrative in Ethics and Psychology. And in that paper, I say I think that 95%, at least 95% of all uses of the word narrative in ethics and psychology could be deleted and replaced by another word without any loss of meaning or you know, valuable significance by words like description, account, explanation, theory. Uh, so that's so I'm already bothered because you're using you're using the word we know we ha- we know. Any normal human being that has an, has pretty decent knowledge of the past course of their lives. Mm. But what that doesn't yet amount to being narrative, uh, as I understand it. And remember, there are two claims being made by the narrativists. One is that we're all like this. The other is that we ought to be like this. We've mentioned uh, previous influences. Uh, one of your old dissertation supervisors being Derek Parfit, who held a view in relation to identity, which is, um, I might mischaracterize it here, but I'll do my best on the back of memory. He says something like, um, future me is just not me in a deep metaphysical sense. So when I save for my retirement, I'm essentially engaging in some kind of 
altruistic uh, practice where I'm helping somebody else completely. But you're you're not saying there's a deep metaphysical truth here, right? Are you just saying phenomenologically from your subjective experience that this is how it feels to you? I'm certainly saying that this is how it feels and that there are people who are like me and we shouldn't be being told that well, there's something wrong with us. Uh, yeah, no, you're right. It follows from his as it were, metaphysical account of what a person is, that, that he's not the same. Mm. Uh, I'm I quite clear on the point that I'm a human being and I will be the same human being and I've been... <laughs> so in that pretty primary metaphysical sense, I do think I'm the same thing. Uh, but I do like... I do want to push forward into something a little metaphysical that I think mm. there's in some sense in which it will not be me who's there in the future and wasn't. It is not me, the person who is here now, who was there in the past. So how does this link into your ideas of death then? Uh, you, you mentioned you, you're um, intrigued by this idea growing up. How does this link to what you call the, the no loss thesis and following that the, the no worse thesis? Well, there's a tension between these two things and I have to face that fact and Make, try to explain it as best as I can, because although I say that I don't think it will be me in the future, I do experience fear of death. I have a lot in my life. And that sounds odd, because if I don't think that it's me in the, in my future life, how can I think that it's, can be me at the very end of my life when I die? Mm. And all I can do is say, this is a true report of how it feels. And it, I think that fear of death can be something visceral and perhaps deeply biologically grounded, which mm. just s stays there, even when future, my own future self seems not to be me. I can't do better than that. And if, if it's, in, in a sense, inconsistent, then so be it. Would you prescribe that somebody adopts your view of the self then to rid themselves of the burdens of you know, uh, their uh, inevitable deaths? Well, given what I've just said, it didn't work for me. But you're right that it might work for someone. And in fact, Derek Parfit has this famous sentence where he says he feels it, it does lighten the worry for him. And yeah, uh, look, you know the, base, the sort of basic teaching story of the Buddha. The reason he went into it in the first place was because he successfully was exposed to someone who was as vision of seeing someone who was sick, someone who was mm. old, and someone who was dead. And this is what... So it was to dissolve fear of death. Oh, which reminds me, I don't know if I can insert this here, but I don't know whether you're aware of this recent paper which studied a number of people, and it turned out very crudely that the Buddhist monks were the ones who appeared to be most afraid of death. Oh, I don't know what to make of that. Mm. It's, there's been a lot of discussion of it recently. There's a lot of ideas of anatta in Buddhism, isn't there? The, the non-permanent self. Anatta. Uh, anatta, I think it is, or is it anatta? Anatta, in, anatta, in yeah. one of the languages, yes. yes. No self, that's yes, right. Yes, no self. And there's a lot of kind of similarities there, isn't there, with the Buddhism and the idea of this, you know, you shouldn't act as if there is a permanent self uh, to kind of keep yourself happy, detach yourself. Yeah, uh, actually, something important to say here, which is what they're thinking of is the self as the place or locus of desires and worries, as I understand it, no sensible Buddhist ever denied the reality of consciousness or the existence of a subject of experience in the moment of experience. Mm. So the no-self thesis doesn't say there is no such thing as that. It just says there is no such thing that is a proper object of concern through time. Can we think of the, the ethical implications of this view then? So if I uh, think that my future self isn't me or you know is, isn't as a separate entity, how that can affect sort of more consequentialist ethical views. Am I going to care about that person? You know, am I going to live a very hedonistic lifestyle? Um, are there any eth ethical implications of this view? Well, I think part of it is exactly what we've just said about Parfit, that he thought that holding this view, he he had to, his his concern for his his future self, I mean, that's that's a phrase that doesn't quite make sense on his view, but you know, we all know what it means. Yeah that he had a moral obligation to that person. Mm. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't, so it wouldn't, let's think, it would, in that case, it just replaces prudential concern with moral concern. And the, I presume that the general upshot is the same. Uh, I suppose it ought to make you less self-concerned as well.
a final point on on ethics we had christian b miller talk to us about uh character education and what he calls the character gap in our last interview you know he says we're mixed characters but we want to be virtuous does is this compatible with uh character education could you adopt your view of the self and be a virtue ethicist i feel i'm being put on the spot in in a good way and there, there may well be tensions in my view i certainly think that you can aspire to try to become to acquire better habits to become mm. better in that sense compatibly with not having any metaphysically heavy view of the continuing self at all that's clear is this the is this the person who's recently said that we should go around saying everybody's honest he you, is yes so you, he calls it virtue labeling so i say galen you're a good man an honest man a generous man you try and live up to this he, he gives a few different remedies to solving the character gap yeah now i think that's I'm clear that that's a good strategy with children, mm. but uh, it does seem that suppose someone isn't, does that mean I have to lie, which is not virtuous, in order to ma- mm. to make other people virtuous, oh, or that, shouldn't I worry about that? Mm. Oh, very nice. That's a that's a good response. He he does give it a warning, and he, it's one of the um, one that he rejects in his actual book, but he says he's open to having his mind changed. So um, perhaps he, I, I'm not sure. I didn't raise this actually in the discussion. Me, Greg, and and Christian tended to agree that it's by getting the word out about the things that influence us and stop us from being good characters, like um, like the bystander effect. And if we make people aware of these psychological studies, then people will be more inclined to fight against embarrassment and, and authority. Um, so that, that was eventually a solution um, to the problem. Yeah, that, that, that does sound right. So you're, ha- you're happy with character education? Incredible how what embarrassment present, prevents people, oh. especially English people, from doing. You know, you really want to get up and give your seat to somebody, but you're just too mm. embarrassed because other people will think you're trying to be good or something. It's true. Yeah. yeah. He, there's a brilliant study he spoke to us about where, you know, a woman falls in the room next to us. You might have heard this one before. And uh, just us three are sat in the room and she should help, help. Only 7% of people got up and helped uh, when they just sat next to Someone who doesn't move. So if if another person doesn't move, they just don't move either. It's a huge effect. Yeah. No doubt that you've rustled some feathers with your stance on free will, and you give an excellent example of a piece of hate mail that you've preserved in the introduction of your latest book, which reads as follows. I just want to say that you are the biggest f***ing idiot, and that this is the worst, most incohesive and absurd philosophical argument I have ever read. Don't write ever again. So what is it about your stance on free will? What is your stance on free will? And why do you think it's provoked such a strong reaction here? Well, it's it's simple. It's just that there's a very strong natural notion of what free will is, given which uh, we can't have it. In fact, we can prove that we can't have it. I could just give you the argument very briefly. Yes, please do. Uh, I mean, it's open to objections, of course, but it goes like this. So step one. You do what you do because of the way you are, all things considered. Good. And I feel like we're on the bus somewhere to a strong conclusion there, but we'll agree. Yep, I agree for now. Yep. Premise two. So, to be truly responsible for what you do, you're going to have to somehow be truly responsible for how you are. Step three. But you can't be truly, or if you like, ultimately responsible for how you are so step four, you can't be truly and ultimately responsible for what you do. Okay, good. So I'm on my way to the shops to buy some cakes. Okay, and I see someone who needs some change on the way. And I stop and I think, ah, this money could do some good here. And I stop and, and what I think is free will kicks in. I do feel like I'm free in that moment. I think most people do. I think I'm free to go to the shop or I'm free to do otherwise and give charitably. Um Is this not an example of free will? Well, you've just given, you've just used the example that I use to show that although I think I can prove that it's impossible, I think we can also show that you can't help believing that you have free will, really in the strongest possible sense. Mm. And this is a remarkable thing. It's what makes the free will problem more striking, or free will skepticism, if you like, more striking than, say, external world skepticism, where you can say, okay, I can't prove that the external world exists, but I can't prove that it doesn't either. So, But in this case, it seems that you can prove that it doesn't exist. So, no, I am going to agree with you. I think that you cannot help 
feeling that you are truly and radically free to choose what to do in that situation. You might even think, oh, determinism is true. In five minutes, I'll be able to turn around and look at this scene and think what I did was determined. Even Mm. if you think that now, you cannot escape in the moment the feeling that you are truly and radically free to do what you do, to choose what to do. So I do what I do because of the way that I am. Okay, so premise one, as you stated. Um, in a, I think it's closer to truth. You there's some interviews on YouTube, and I'll link to them in um, on the website. And uh, you're link, um, you're speaking about. Okay, I'll give you a soul. I'll give you consciousness. So the classic response. It's normally phrased like this: uh, the physical world is causally uh, causally determined, like billiard balls on the table. And it seems your mind is physical stuff too, and therefore it's subject to cause and effect. So where can you say you step in and have free will? And the Christian says, ah, it's a soul. You, you're allowing them to have a soul in this argument, are you not? I can have souls and consciousness. It doesn't, isn't, don't I act because of the, my decisions that I formulate within my soul? Doesn't make any difference. So the two points here. First of all, uh, if you've got a soul, um, well, you're not responsible, ultimately responsible for how it is. So the other point is, it doesn't even matter if determinism isn't true. Even if determinism is false, you still can't be radically self-determining or self-creating in such a way that you can be truly responsible for how you are. And, I mean, let you, we can make this a bit more down-to-earth and empirical here. Look, how are... How are what, <laughs> Why are you the way you are? Well, first there's the genetic component, which is not insignificant. And then there's the first five years of life, which is very, very significant. And there is no way in which you can get back. So that, I think that largely sets character. Mm. So suppose, suppose after that you decide to try to change yourself. So you do. You set, or rather you set out on a course of action to change yourself. Well, two things can happen very crudely. You can succeed or you can fail. But uh, if you succeed, well, you're already lucky to be the kind of person who would succeed if they did try to change themselves. And if you fail, you're unlucky in that respect. You can't get back behind yourself in order to make yourself, in order to, in such a way as to be truly and ultimately, ultimately responsible for how you are. That's the problem. And it doesn't matter whether determinism is true or not, or whether you have an immaterial soul or not. It makes no difference. Even if um, the common response to the debate is at a, at a quantum level that things are just random and therefore it, 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 the world isn't just cause and effect. You, this response to that as well, doesn't it? How, how can you explain to the listener? Because this is a very common response to the determinism arguments. Fundamentally, physics has works randomly. Could you could you explain how? Yeah, your response it's true. Is? It's a it's a very popular response. It's being it's been in the air. For, most of the last century, some very you know important, clever people have put it forward, but it's useless because the idea that some random event uh, affects either how you are or what you do doesn't make it you. It doesn't mean that you're responsible. On the contrary, if it's a random event, it just makes it even less true that it's you. So what they're going to have to, what they're going to need here is the idea that you, whatever you is, can somehow harness the quantum indeterminate events and use them to break into free will. But then that you, where did that come from? Mm. That's the you that you're not ultimately responsible for. I guess I can see why this view would rustle some feathers, so to speak. So let's say that, okay, I've I've, I've, I've listened listened to your argument. I've read your argument. I'm just going to keep living my life to, I need, I've got lots of things to do, the business of life to get on with. Um, You know, I'm going to walk around uh, just pretending that I have free will. Uh, am I committing philosophical suicide if I do that? I don't. I'm not sure what to say. I mean, I I can't live it myself, and I gave the reason why. I, I it's a it's almost a, it's a, almost a logical point that you cannot live it. In fact, in my first book, I tried to work out could there be a creature that was a rational, self conscious agent that could truly live the, the lack of free will, and I'm, I wasn't sure. I didn't reach a clear conclusion on that. I would certainly suggest that you keep on as you are. And uh, no, but wait, maybe we should mention here my father's famous reaction mm, to all yes. this, where he says, look, we have these emotional reactions to other people, and they are so fundamental and that we couldn't 
We can't get rid of them, and things like gratitude and resentment, and they, in effect, presuppose some kind of idea that other people have free will. Uh, mm. So that's actually a different argument for why we couldn't give it up. My argument is different. It's saying you, in, in you, the individual in the situation of choice with the cake and the the, the Oxfam box, mm. can't help thinking of yourself as free. So actually, the two views they add together into yeah. a very powerful case mm. for why we can't live it. So is that a justification? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So the listener might be thinking, ah, Galen, you convinced me. Okay, I don't have free will. I'm not, I can't ultimately be responsible for the way I am and therefore I can't be ultimately free. But there's got to be some responses out there to your position. Uh, is there a particular one you think is the strongest reply to your argument? Uh, well, it has to be an account that says that freedom and in particular moral responsibility, because that's what we really care more about mm. is compatible with determinism. So it has to be a much more modest notion of freedom and moral responsibility. And I, I think all the all the satisfactory replies, I mean they're not they're not replies to the problem as posed, but they just say we can make good sense of a of a more moderate notion of free will. And it's really rather unsurprising. It's just the account of a normally responsible I look how I use the word. A responsible adult has reached the age of reason. Is is reasons responsive, as some people say? So they're not kleptomaniacs. They're not subject to some compulsion. Mm. Just an an ordinary human being with ordinary what we see of what we see as ordinary capacities to do otherwise or to make genuine choices. And the, look, we do look. Here's one point. We really do make choices. Mm. Some people think that free will means we don't really make choices. That's not true because, I mean, take a really simple case like, shall I go to see movie A or movie B? Mm. You make, you really make a choice or which of these two items on the menu shall I have? So cho making choices is completely compatible with determinism. So we're free, but in a very, very weak sense. We're not ultimately free, but we're free in the sense that we make choices. Is this okay to say? Uh, uh, yes, but again, that may not be enough. We do, we uh, we make we make. Uh, wow, what's the matter with me? This is bad. This is a bad day. I'm having. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'm it's not, a good day. I'll, I'll label it good day, and then you'll want to live up to it. <laughs> we'll see if it works. Last question on free will before we move on. If we can't be considered ultimately responsible for the way we are, and now we're not, therefore we're not ultimately free. Shall we rid our society of the idea that we can be morally responsible? Um, so let's say Ollie kicks a dog. I can describe his disposition that he's nasty and evil, but ultimately I can't say metaphysically he's responsible for that action and therefore he can't be, um, you know, punished. It's not a justified punishment because he's not responsible for his action. Do you want to see society rid itself of the illusion of f ultimate free will? We can't. We can't do that. Uh, we need a system of we need a system of punishment. We need a, um, I, I say that even though I know that the traditional justifications of punishment not very good. So deterrence mm. doesn't seem to work. Um, reform doesn't seem to work. In fact, on the contrary, prisons are thought to be schools for crime. Mm -hmm. And prevention works only in the sense that when people are actually locked up, they can't do it. Uh, but it, I think here I would revert to. My father, P. F. Strawson's view that it, we, we, our whole being is committed to this idea in the in the emotions we feel towards other people. It's not it's not eliminable. And he then says, "Well, let's suppose to, you know, we could have a choice of sort of pressing a button that all goes away." And he mm. says, "Well, actually, what he says is, is that choice could only be made in the light of the overall gains and losses to human life." And I think nearly everyone would agree that human life would be deeply impoverished by that. So, Galen, in your opinion, what is the silliest claim ever made? Well, I have said that it's the claim that consciousness doesn't exist. You could argue that there is a sillier claim, which, mm. which is that nothing exists. Ah, um, that's going to be my next question. Do you really think this is the silliest claim, or well, is it more of a, a poetic license you've afforded? Well, I, I think what I mean is the silliest claim that's ever been seriously made in a theoretical context. Right. So it was Uriah Kriegel who put this question to me recently. He said, no, or rather he put this alternative, nothing exists, which of course is immediately self-refuting because okay. the occasion 
the the very utterance of nothing exists is a something that exists. Mm. Um, but I don't know whether that has ever been seriously maintained in a theoretical context. You might think that it has, because some people say all is illusion. But then, of course, that raises the question, well, at least there's illusion. Right. Mm. I'm trying to think of a sillier claim that's taken seriously in philosophy. Um, Nagel's, um, it's a lot of students these days, we do a lot of work with young people, um, and students will say everything's subjective. Or you might have heard this one. I think Nagel talks about it. So if everything's subjective, then that statement isn't objectively true. So that can't be the case. And if that statement is subjective, then it's not objectively true that all statements are subjective. Yet this is a phrase people like to throw around. Is this not sillier? Not sillier, no. Not nearly as silly. I mean, very silly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Um, so you've argued then that, uh, so the silliest claim ever made is that people deny the existence of consciousness. You refer to them as the deniers. I do. Um, so I guess, w what's your theory of consciousness then? There's something it's like to be me now. And I experience you both in front of me and the listener experiences this in their ears. There's something it is like to hear this noise. Um, how do you explain this? You, you say you're a, a naturalist or a real naturalist. So how can you explain the existence of consciousness? What have I got to explain? Um, this table here, there's, you know, the, the person on the street would say this table doesn't have inner experience, can't experience the world, world subjectively. So how come when table matter goes, arranges itself brain wise, does consciousness, um, arise? And you can see I'm, I can see where you're going. <laughs> well, I mean, you've—I don't know. Maybe we're going. Maybe this is sort of jumping ahead a bit. But um, what I think is this: since we know that consciousness exists, and I believe—I think it's really far beyond reasonable doubt by now—that it's just a matter of brain processes. Mm. I think that that we have to move to the conclusion that there's something consciousness involving in matter right from the start. I don't know whether you wanted to go on to this so quickly, but I, I was resisting the question, how do we explain it? Because one view is that, why does nobody ever ask, how do we explain the existence of matter hmm. considered in the ordinary way? Um, all I will say about consciousness, we know exactly what it is, and really it's the only thing that we know exactly what it is in general terms. So why, so again, a lot of people talk about the mystery of consciousness. Hmm. That, that, there's a huge assumption built into that phrase, which is, it's a mystery because we think we know what matter is and we think that matter isn't conscious and then we wonder where the consciousness came from. But that just begs a huge question. So the ordinary person works on the assumption, you say, that physical matter does not experience the world. Okay. So, but where does the burden of proof lie? Surely we clearly can see that the table is here. It's a physical thing. And why assume either way? Do we, do you want us to be neutral on this point? Or do you want us to assume on the other side of the coin that it is experiencing the world? The burden of, well, the burden of proof. What you have to do is start from the, what you know for certain. It's always a good idea. I'm not mm. saying it's a mandatory, but it's always a good idea. And the only thing we know for certain, absolutely for certain, I claim, is that is that we're conscious and we know what consciousness is. Not only in the sort of particular flavors that we get it in, but from that we form a general conception of consciousness so that we can think things like, maybe Martians have consciousness that's completely unlike ours. That makes perfect immediate sense to us. So that shows that we have a general notion of what it is. It's not just tied to, you know, our senses and so on. So that's the one thing we know. Uh, so where does the burden of proof lie? The burden of proof, the, then the question is, is there anything else? The only thing we know for certain is consciousness. Do we know that there's any other kind of stuff? Do we know for certain? And the answer to that question is no. Well, it's interesting because we, Dan Dennett referenced you in his explanation of this. He says the, the panpsychist claims he has, um, access to everything about his mind. And you know, Galen, what consciousness is, but you wouldn't sit here and tell us you know everything about your appendix. It seems very odd for you to claim that you know more about it than somebody else. So 
could you could you respond that's basically his response to he says you don't know what it is in the same way that you wouldn't be so absurd to claim you know what your appendix is through your own reflection i think there are many many things i don't know about my mind but i know what consciousness is and if dan was here i mean much as i like him i'd probably give him a sharp kick at this point say there's an example for you <laughs> that's an example Good. and the point about that is that it's it's immediately presented in its intrinsic nature. Mm. All I'm claiming to know is the thing that, uh, well, the thing that you can't doubt. Right. All sorts of extraordinary things about minds and brains that I don't know. Well, I know something about them because I've read books like everybody else. Or, mm. But many, many things I don't know. I'm only claiming to know the given qualitative character of of certain experiences as I have them. For example, my current visual experience, which includes you guys. So um, here comes my Philip Goff impression, which is becoming famous at this point. In episode 25, we had Goff and, and David Papineau come on, who, who you know both uh, work well. And Goff says, it just seems like I understand what it's like to feel pain. Um, it's uncanny, isn't it? And he says, um, it's, it's transparently revealed to me that I know everything it is to feel pain. Uh, to what extent would you say you agree with, with Goff's ideas on panpsychism? Uh, listeners should be already aware of them. Well, we're already jumping. We've already got two things here. One is this claim of knowledge of the intrinsic nature of certain conscious experiences, mm. which is a long way short of anything to do with panpsychism. But, uh, no, I just, oh, well, look, I agree with him. Yeah. The funny thing is that David Papineau was my teacher and I was Philip Goff's teacher, so I seem to stand between them there. Um, it's interesting. So that first part, do you think this is where the debate lies? Uh, Dennett told us he thinks this is um, the point in which you both uh, go your own ways down your separate paths. He says, you don't want to know what it's like to feel pain, Galen, and you say, yes, I do. And then you have this fundamental difference and you go off in your separate ways. It, does the whole debate in philosophy of mind at the moment, does it... Is, is it all down to this fundamental question? I'm not sure that's quite how to put it, because is, is Dennett really saying you don't know what it's like to feel pain? I think that there are, it's possible to show that he's really saying that pain is an illusion. And when he says that, he seems to mean that there really is no what it is like at all. Mm. It seems pretty clear that that's what it's mean. And that's when that certainly is the end of argument. Because I don't know what to say to him. Uh, you know, that's when you, then I would say that's the silliest claim anyone ever made. And then I want to, I want to sort of use emotional arguments like saying, so no one has really ever suffered in the whole history of mm. the world. And then he will reply that, of course, they have. But then when you look at his account of what it is, it comes down, he says this, to comp computational and uh, informational states. And the, the feeliness is an illusion. It doesn't exist. He says this. Good. I think it would be interesting for listeners because there's two points, I guess, which Dennett made in that episode, which uh, I think need addressing or else it's just going to, it will just be assumed that he's correct on these two points. Um, the first one, I think, is more powerful than the second. So we'll start off with the, the tougher one. So he'll say, Galen, okay, you are you think that uh, you know what consciousness is, as you've explained to us, and you explain it by not adopting the man or woman on the street's assumption that things don't experience the world. So you adopt panpsychism and say that fundamentally, I guess, is it called experiential? Uh, it's a micro-psychism. You want to say that a little electron can kind of experience the world? Um I've I've discussed that view. I've never committed myself to that view. Okay. So can I say can you 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 agree with panpsychism and goth though as you've stated well, to an extent? You're a panpsychist. I no. I want to be more I think that it's the most plausible, um, parsimonious, elegant, hard nosed theory in the present state of our knowledge. Good. That's, that's good philosopher's caution. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Exactly. Um, so, so Dennett says to us, ah, oh, I've got this great view as well. It's called pan niftyism. And why not assume that the whole world is just nifty? And, uh, I assume that electrons can be nifty and that fundamentally, um, the world is that and not conscious. And he says, panpsychism does not solve the very problem which it goes out to solve, which is how consciousness comes about 
in in the mind in in the brain so what Dennett's getting at here is the combination problem how do lots of little micro experiences come together to form one complete mind because it seems phenomenologically talking to you now that my experience isn't made up of lots of little experiences but one unified whole so I guess there's two formulations of the problem there um the subject summing problem you might call it so how do can can you solve the combination <laughs> problem Gosh, look, there's about four, <laughs> there's four questions stacked on top Sorry, of each other Sorry, it's my poor there. question asking that. Um, can, I, can I ask you in, in, in a word then? Um, does panpsychism go solve the problem that it is established to solve? Some people thought that the problem was how to explain consciousness. Uh, I think that was already that 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 question already begged. A question that was that it was something that needed explanation rather than something we just accept as existing in the way that we accept matter as just existing. So I, I think that the demand for an explanation of its existence is already a mistake. If you want to know how you can legitimately demand an explanation of the existence of complex consciousness like ours or indeed dogs or any evolved creature, and my answer to that is evolution by natural selection. Mm. So here's a, I don't know if this will help, but very briefly, look, evolution needs some needs something to work on. So evolution, we can say, found bodily shapes and it got to work on them and it produced us with our arms and legs and our wonderful opposable thumbs. Mm. Uh, so too, evolution produced complicated consciousness um, um, and vision like the eagle's vision and sense of smell like the dog's smell but it had to have something to work on and what it had to work on was as it were rudimentary consciousness that was already there mm. so i can i would think it very important to give exp detailed explanations of the evolution of all interesting kinds of consciousness all biologically evolved consciousness yes. but uh, i think that you can't get the conscious from the utterly non-conscious so the whole trend of the of the evolutionary argument is, in fact, that there must have been some rudimentary stuff already there that evolution got to work on and developed into these special, specialized forms. So appeal to evolution seems to me to work against Dan Dennett's position. So, again, we've mentioned our interview with Daniel Dennett a couple of times, and listeners will remember that uh, Greg at the time posed um, your quote. He gave him your quotation from the New York Review of Books in which you said the following. What is the silliest claim ever made? The competition is fierce, but I think the answer is easy. Some people have denied the existence of consciousness. Conscious experience, the subjective character of experience, the what it is like of experience. Next to this denial, I'll call it the denial, every known religious belief is only a little less sensible than the belief that the grass is green. One of the strangest things the deniers say is that although it seems that there is a conscious experience, there isn't really any conscious experience. The seeming is, in fact, an illusion. The trouble with this is that any such illusion is already and necessarily an actual instance of the thing said to be an illusion. Suppose you're hypnotized to feel intense pain. Someone may say to you that you're not really in pain and that pain is illusionary because you haven't really suffered any bodily damage. But to seem to feel pain is to be in pain. It's not possible here to open up a gap between appearance and reality, between what is and what seems. Now, I'll give you Dennett's response um, to this. It's quite lengthy, so, so bear with me. I'm so grateful for Galen for this passionate and vivid expression of views that are indeed very opposed to mine, but of course a complete misrepresentation of my position. But the reason I'm grateful to him is that I would not have dared put these words in the mouth of my fictional character Otto from Consciousness Explained. Because people would say, oh, he's creating a straw man, and a living, breathing, table-thumping strawson is better than a straw man any day. And he really says them. He really says those things. And you just have to stop and think about the state of mind he's in to award me the honor of having held the silliest idea anybody has ever had. Okay, now the prospect that he may be misinterpreting me seems fairly likely. And indeed, in the very quotation you've mentioned, he misinterprets me. As I've said, many number of times, I'm not denying that consciousness exists. I'm just saying you're wrong about its nature. 
Yes, we're conscious, but it's not what you think it is. It's rather different. Unless he thinks he has some kind of papal infallibility about the nature of consciousness, and sometimes it looks as if that's what he's saying, then there would be some ground for his claim that the very illusion that I claim would be an instance of the phenomenon, but no, it's not. It's not an instance of his phenomenon because he's got a bad theory of consciousness. Consciousness is not the way he thinks it is, and so there is no inconsistency at all. I'm so glad that he wrote that because if ever I thought I'm beating a dead horse, no, 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 there are some people out there and in fact some clever and articulate people who just don't get it and they don't want to get it. They don't want to get it apparently because a lot of other people get it and they think it's morally pernicious. That's the really interesting fact about it is that he's really afraid that I'll talk people into this and this will be dire. This will be a dire consequence. And it's only going to be a dire consequence if you think that the value of human life and of, hu of the human mind and the possibility of free will is dependent on having the kind of mind that Strawson thinks we have. He's just wrong about what a mind is. So there's a lot there. I guess there's two key things, really. One, do you think you're straw manning Dennett's position? No, of course not. In fact, it's kind of, I mean, if you want to look at the numbers, it's 7 billion plus against about 200 people. He's in the 200. And secondly, is he right to say that you're, I guess it links into the first, is he right to say that your understanding of consciousness is, is wrong when he says it's not what you think it is, Gail? And what is, is this going to be down to that fundamental disagreement I mentioned a moment ago? It's really, I, I mean, I think his view is so crazy, it's hard to know what to say. Because what his view amounts to is the view that there is no such thing as what we all ordinarily call consciousness. And he he's very clear. He says that what he means by consciousness is as he has these two nice phrases. He always mm -hmm. has nice phrases. Consciousness, as he says, is fame in the brain. That is, it's it's a state that is influential in influencing other states. And then he says it's cerebral celebrity. Mm -hmm. Same idea. So that's what he thinks consciousness is. And I just think, no, it's the, it's the fundamental what it is like of seeing red. I, we, I, I, we should do more work on getting nice examples. You know, people always mention orgasms, you know, philosophers always talk. And, uh, but, you know, pain, the taste of garlic, so on, so on, so on. Mm. It's that. That's all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about anything that involves any cognitive ability at all, whereas his notion is already essentially cog cognitive and functionally effective. Are we going to make any progress here? I mean, are we beating a dead horse ourselves in philosophy of mind? Are you and it seems very difficult to think that you and someone like Dennett will ever come to agreement. We like to think of philosophers as changing their minds in the light of new arguments and debates. But is there any hope of some kind of agreement be between you on, on this question? Well, I doubt it, but I doubt it for, as it were, reasons of deep psychology. And there are mm. people I like to quote on this. Um, you know, once people commit once especially thinkers commit to a certain position, it's very, very, very hard for them to change their minds. And uh, Herbert Feigl has this idea that we they sort of invest in them so deeply they committed to them. But, I mean, let me. I, is it worth my tr just trying to make a bit clearer that then it really is denying the existence mm, yes, of what... Yes, please do. So, I mean, let's, like let's go to his famous remark where he says... He, he, as you probably know, philosophers and your listeners probably know, philosophers use the word zombie as a technical yeah. term. Mm. So a zombie, mm. roughly, something that looks and behaves just like a human being, but isn't conscious. That is, it doesn't have qualia. It doesn't have experiences of pain and red that we, we know we have. So, and then Dennett himself introduces the term and says, look, a zombie is behaviorally indistinguishable from a normal human being, but is not conscious. That's a quote. So in his words, in, in Dennett's words again, there is nothing it's like to be a zombie. It just seems that way to observers. And then he says, are zombies possible? And he answers, they're not just possible, they're actual, we're all zombies. Mm. So that is the view that you have to make. You have to understand what he says about consciousness in the light of that extremely clear statement by him. So here's another nice quotation. It's always, then it's always a pleasure to read. When I squint just right, he says, it does sort of seem that consciousness must be something in addition to all the things it does for us and to us, some special private glow or here I amness that would be absent in any robot. And I've learned not to credit the hunch. I think it is a flat out mistake, a failure of imagination. So there is nothing in us that would be absent in any robot. 
So you go on, you put this quote in your book and you say, if he's right, no one has really suffered or in spite of uh, agonizing diseases, no one's really experienced this suffering. You That's stand right. by this. He did, no yes. one's actually experienced these things. He, he, on it follows inexorably from his view as far as I can see. And I'd like to say one more thing about the bit you read out because mm. he says, the really interesting fact mm. is that I'm going to talk people into it and this will be dire. Are you, are you say, afraid? Not at all. I'm, I, I should say that I added that sentence, the final sentence, unwillingly mm. at the request of the editors of the New York, New York Review Daily blog. Mm. Well, it strikes me as quite, um, quite against the rest of your philosophy. So free will, your idea that we're not ultimately free, that seems to have very dangerous consequences if more pe if people recognize this. Um, so it's odd to, for the suggestion being that you know, you're scared that if this isn't true and if people don't really have consciousness in the way that you see it, the consequences will be dire. But elsewhere in your philosophy, you seem to favor truth well, you seem to consistently favor truth over the pragmatic things that... Yes. No, but it's a good point you make because you could do a P.F. Strawson argument about consciousness just as for free will. Look, mm. even if then it is right. I mean, he himself says if the, it's some sort of illusion, but he also says that it's incredible. Everybody's in the grip of this illusion. It's certainly not going to go away. Um, think about how we automatically... Well, not only how we f feel when we feel pain ourselves, but how we feel deeply sympathetic when we see other people mm. suffering. This is t way deeper, too deep in us. And not that I'm worried, but there is, of course, a huge difference because consciousness is real and strong free will isn't. <laughs> the problem for all people who hold Dennett's views is, it seems to me, is this, that they are pre-committed to a view of what matter is. They think that matter is something essentially non-conscious and they agree with me that you couldn't get consciousness out of the utterly non-conscious. So since they're committed to the view that it is in its fundamental nature non-conscious, they cannot believe in consciousness. Mm. My point that I want to make there is always the same, is don't think that physics gives you any reason to think that. It doesn't. This is what I call the silence of physics. Physics does gives us these wonderful equations that allow us to do all sorts of things, but doesn't tell us about the ultimate intrinsic nature of matter. So the big mistake by all the deniers is the mis is the mistake they start from, the mistake of thinking that they know what matter is and know in particular that it is in its fundamental nature wholly and utterly non-conscious. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. Excellent. That was that great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. That was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>